Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. It's like coffee with an analyst, but there's no actual coffee. Each episode, we interviewed an expert in the field of law enforcement analysis to share their career-defining stories and to get their insights on the world. Please join us on recognizing and learning from these brilliant minds as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 10 years of law enforcement analysis experience. He's a former president of Morcan, the Mid-America Regional Crime Analysis Network. He is currently the training director for the IACA. Please welcome Kyle Stoker. Kyle, how are we doing? I'm good. How are you? I am doing great. So, of course, we're going to get into training with the IACA, but I yep. thought we would first go back in time and talk about the start of your career. And you started as a police officer mm-hmm. in Olathe Police yep. Department. Yep. Yes. Um, I, from about high school on, I was just bound and determined. I really, really wanted to be a cop and knew that was how I wanted to spend my career and wanted to help people. And then I got into it and, you know, it's going to sound really kind of stupid, but I did not realize until I was dealing with the public every single day, I didn't realize how much of an introvert I was. Um, and, and like I said, it makes me feel stupid now because I'm, a, I'm like as an introverted as, as you can get. And looking back, it's like, wow, how did I not know that about myself? But, you know, I was 22 when I got hired. I hadn't even officially graduated college yet when they gave me the job offer. I had to actually leave the, I did my finals early, uh, started the academy. And then a couple of weeks into the academy, I left early on a Friday afternoon to drive back to my college town to participate in my graduation ceremony. So I was really young. So I did that for about three years and realized that it just wasn't, wasn't what I wanted to spend you know, the next 30 years of my career doing. But around that time was when they hired an analyst and I got exposed to crime analysis and and realized that that's really kind of what I wanted to go into. And it just so happened that um, at my local community college, they had an evening class, Crime Analysis 101, that I signed up for just as, you know, as an adult student, just to kind of audit the class. And just from the very first lecture, um, completely fell in love with it and thought, this is it. This is what I want to do. So it really, you know, that experience, I'm glad I have it. I think it gives me some credibility with my officers. It gives me some insight into what they're dealing with. But I'm also really glad that I'm not doing that job uh, anymore. I'm glad to be in an office instead. So when you left Olathe, Mm -hmm. as a police officer. What did you do next? Well, the plan was they were, they were going to hire a second uh, analyst. They were planning on hiring a second analyst within that next year. So the plan was that I would leave as a, as an officer, be able to get some, get some training. The instructor uh, of that class, uh, Susan Whitford asked me to come at the end of it. She asked me to come and and kind of volunteer for her because she was the the full-time analyst at Shawnee, Kansas at the time. And so it was kind of the plan that I would get some experience in a crime analysis unit, get some training. I had joined Marcan and had gotten involved there and therefore also joined the IACA. So I had hoped that I'd be able to turn around and basically get hired back at Olathe as that second analyst. Of course, like all plans, it fell apart. If I remember correctly, they didn't actually hire anybody in that hiring process. I don't know what exactly went wrong. But around that same time, what, that was in 2008, and that was when you know the recession hit. And so a few months of unemployment ended up, that turned into like a year and a half. Wow. So I went through, this whole time, I was still volunteering with Shawnee and still, still getting that hands-on experience. But I went through, well, Raytown was my fifth position that I applied for, fifth hiring process that I went for. And in a couple of them, I got all the way to the interview with the chief. And in one, this one was the most frustrating, but um, the advertisement and all the oral boards, everything up to that point had advertised for a crime analyst. 
when I went in to talk to the chief, the very first thing he said to me was, you know, this isn't a crime analyst. This is an admin assistant. And what he actually wanted was like an admin assistant for investigations to do, you know, like interview transcription and stuff. And it was his command staff. It was, uh, it was a major captain. I don't remember what the rank was, but the, the lower ranking commander who had been running the process up to that point was really pushing to get an analyst. And so there was a pretty big mismatch between you know, what the commander wanted, what the chief wanted. Of course, the chief's going to win in the end. So I did not get that position, which worked out for the best because I didn't want to be an office, you know, an office manager or an admin assistant. But yeah, it was kind of discouraging to go through all those processes over and over and over again. But at the same time, it was really good, you know, experience to go through that many oral boards and that many testing processes. And, and it allowed me to kind of, you know, refine my resume and my interview skills and things like that. And so when Raytown came along, all the stars aligned and and here I am 10 years later. So, yeah, that is frustrating. I can't imagine the surprise yeah. look on your face when the oh, chief yeah. says that, hey, do you know how to dictate? Uh-huh. <laughs> it was it was like the shortest interview. I mean, it was it was embarrassing kind of. But at the same time, I was like, this is what you advertise for. This is what you're like. You're, literally, your oral board questions were crime analysis oriented. So it was like a five minute discussion. I mean, you know. I tried to be as polite and respectful as possible and he was polite about it, but it very, it was very clearly that like our goals did not match up and it was just not going to be a good fit. So, you know, it worked out in the end, like I said. So what advice do you have for people that are going through this process, maybe going through several interviews and you certainly persevered? Yeah. And I think perseverance is, you know, that's going to be one of the most important things. It is frustrating. It is disheartening to make it all the way through a hiring process to even get to an interview with the chief or an interview at a higher level and then not get it in the end. But you need to take those opportunities and use those to then improve, like I said, your interview skills, improve your resume, improve your portfolio, whatever it is for the next time around. Because you never know, maybe they'll ask some of the same questions, maybe the testing process will be the same and you'll you'll get better every single time. My other piece of advice, it certainly worked for me and, and it worked for, I'm in the Kansas City metro area and there are half a dozen of us or so in this working analyst now, full-time analyst now in the Kansas City metro area who all started the same way I did, kind of volunteering and interning uh, with Susan. If you can get a full-time analyst to let you be an intern, let you be a volunteer, even if they will let you come and you know take them to lunch, kind of pick their brain for an hour, what, however much time they will grant you, that's really valuable. Because one, you can get a better idea of what the job actually is and decide, you know, is this really something that I want to devote my life to, my career to? But two, it gives you connections. It lets you build a portfolio. I mean, I think it really, really helped that in my process with Raytown that I was able to provide them crime bulletins that I'd made, comset presentations that I'd made, different products that I had done. And also that I already knew so many of the analysts around the metro area, they knew that on day one, I could literally walk in and start working. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> they, My very first day, uh, I went on a ride along in the morning and then in the afternoon, they showed me to, my first office was a closet that they had converted into an office. They showed me to a desk, said, here's your passwords. Okay, go go analyze. Just do your thing. Because <laughs> they'd never had an analyst before. And so I, li- I was like, okay. And they just left me in there. And so I just sat down and basically kind of started recreating what I had done at Shawnee. They were like blown away by that. And of course, over time, I learned to tailor things to what they specifically needed and what fit here, but it gave me a starting point. And so that's, that's kind of my two big pieces is just don't give up, take those quote unquote failures and turn them around into experience to improve for next time. But also really, if there's any possible way you can get hooked up with a local analyst to, like I said, shadow them, even if you sit with them for uh, you know half a day or a day or take them to lunch or grab a cup of coffee, or if you can, some kind of long-term you know volunteer opportunity where you go in once a week or a couple of times a week or whatever, that's really, really valuable. And I guess uh, now is just as good a time as any for me to put a shameless plug in. So we just published Sean Bear's Guide to Hiring a Law Enforcement Analyst. That's a limited podcast series. So for those that are looking for more advice on the hiring process, please check that out. Or if you're a middle manager and hiring manager looking for tips on how to hire, it's a useful tool as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, whatever resources that you can find, things that will give you advice. We have 
at least one webinar that I know of in the library that talks about that just kind of walks you through in general what is the hiring process like for a law enforcement agency because it's totally different from the civilian world I mean you know the background check here was so extensive yeah you'll go through some of that stuff at, at maybe a private company but it's not going to be the same and, and there's some quirks that you need to know and be prepared for that podcast our video in the library, just asking for help on the IACA forums. That's a great start too. For Shawnee, when you were volunteering there, did you have to go through a background check as well? So they knew, Shawnee and Olathe are in the same county. Their agency's pretty much right next to each other. They knew that I had, this was literally within months of me leaving as a sworn officer. I'm not sure what exactly happened behind the scenes, but I don't believe they did like a really extensive <laughs> background on me. I think they pretty much were like, oh yeah. You just came from Olathe. It's good to go. So then when you're volunteering, what kind of task are you doing? She had me doing all kinds of different things. Uh, I created stolen auto hot sheets. We updated sex offender records that, that the county would like mail out to, to the PD every month or every week or whatever. We created crime bulletins. They had their version of CompStat was called something different, but we would produce slides for that PowerPoint. Then on at least one occasion when Susan couldn't be there, I presented part of that. That presentation was, you know, that CompStat meeting was a lot of different speakers, but I presented the crime analysis portion for it. So I got to do a lot of different things and it was really, really helpful because like I said, when I started at Raytown, I literally could just recreate what I had done there and apply it to Raytown, you know, data and use Raytown sources and things. So it gave me a really big head start, I feel like. So then... How many hours a week were you volunteering? Sometimes I would come in. It kind of depended on what else I had going on that week and kind of what her schedule was like. Sometimes it was, I would come in for like an afternoon and work like three or four hours. There were, I think sometimes that I would come in, it's been a while now, but I think there were sometimes that I would try to come in like a couple of times a week. Cause like I said, for part of that, I was unemployed. So I, you know, my schedule was pretty open and I, it was like, well, I might as well get some experience out of it and put my time to good use. So it kind of varied, but on average, probably three to five hours a week. And then at that same time, you're being exposed to all the computer programs and data oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. everything else. That's good. Yep. And then you eventually get a clerk's position at Johnson County Sheriff's Office. Yeah, that's and... that's the local sheriff's office. And it, it was pretty much, I needed a job. That was after four failed crime analysis <laughs> processes. Part of the time I did like jail visitation, which was not interesting at all. And then they eventually moved me into kind of the warrant section where before prisoners would get released, I'd basically check them for warrants and make sure the bond paperwork when everything was correct. But it, it, was a, it was a good place to work. It was good experience, but it was mostly just a job. So anything working as a clerk helped you later as being a crime analyst? Mm, no, not really. Um, <laughs> it was the most god-awful schedule ever because I was the like swing shift relief guy. So I worked two evening shifts and then I would get off at like seven o'clock on Friday night and have essentially like 24 hours off and then work midnights over the overnight shift on Saturday. So I had two evenings, a midnight, and then two day shifts all in one week. And that, uh, that rotated every week for God knows however many weeks. By that point, I had started the process with Raytown, but I was waiting for them to finish the background check. So the only reason I got through that was because I knew that, you know, Raytown was doing my background and it was looking good and I was feeling pretty good about the prospects and all that. So then you literally hit the ground running once yes. you go to Raytown, as, uh -huh. as you mentioned. Did they have a ComStat process or what were some of the products that you were producing? No, they, they did not have a ComStat process. They had never had an analyst before. Raytown is, I'll give you a little bit of background. Raytown is a very small first ring suburb of Kansas City, Missouri. We are just under 30,000 people and we're geographically, we're pretty much completely surrounded by Kansas City, Missouri. So it's kind of a, a community that feels like a small town, but we're really not because we're surrounded by this bigger, bigger city. Unfortunately, there is a lot of violence in this area and they needed a, an analyst pretty badly. They were able to push for this public safety sales tax that added several officer positions, a couple of dispatchers and me. And then I think there was some money in there for different like software and technology and stuff like that. But they didn't really know what an analyst could do. So it was kind of cool in the fact that, like I said, they literally put me in an office and was just like, okay, go do it. 
So I didn't have a whole lot of guidance from them on what kind of stuff they wanted, which is both a good and a bad thing. Cause one, it let me be creative and try some different things. And honestly, I would try some products and make them for a little while. And then if I didn't get good feedback, I just stopped making it. And the fact that nobody asked like, Hey, where is this report was a sign to me that, Hey, that's not worth doing. Cause they didn't <laughs> notice that I'm not making it anymore. But it also meant that I really didn't get much direction in terms of like what exactly they wanted. So that kind of took some time to build up. So like I said, I pretty much just, I started with recreating the arrest report and, and the crime bulletin and the hot sheet and things like that, that I that I had done at Shawnee. And then I, I will admit, I blatantly steal from other analysts. Like if I see a product <laughs> that other people make, it looks good and it serves a purpose that I'm not already filling. I will absolutely reach out to them and be like, hey, will you share that template with me? I love this product. I think that's a great idea. Like there's no shame in that. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Use your network, use your local agencies and your local analysts to give you a leg up on things like that. So yeah. Well, if you're asking permission, it's not really stealing. Well, yeah. It's true. <laughs> yeah. So if Raytown is totally surrounded by Kansas City, then do you have a lot of issues with boundaries? Oh yeah. Because they you know, they don't it's not like the crooks are like, oh, that's Kansas City or over there. That's Raytown. I'm going to stop here on this side of the street. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, that's definitely an issue. There's a lot of crossover between our people and theirs. And I've got good relationships with all. So there's Kansas City's broken up into different divisions and there's a different analyst at each division. And I think there's three, we actually border three different divisions, but I've got a good relationship with all of them. Can pick up the phone and say, hey, tell me about this guy or did you have a burglary like this or whatever. The local analyst community in Kansas City, I'm really proud of us because I think we do a really fantastic job of sharing information and sharing resources and ideas and helping each other grow. And if I don't have access to a particular product, I know other people who do, and they have always been really willing, like, hey, I don't have clear. Can you run this guy in clear for me? Yeah, no problem. And, and things like that. It's definitely a team sport. So make sure you are a team player. Good saying. I love it. So you're in on the peer support team with the mm -hmm. department. What do you do with that? So peer support for those people that are not kind of familiar with it, it's literally kind of what it sounds like. So, you know, obviously in law enforcement, we deal with some pretty traumatic things um, and the officers more directly, but analysts too, because we're still reading reports and sometimes we're at crime scenes and seeing some pretty awful pictures and things. And so it peer support recognizes that, um, you know, stress and trauma can build up over time. They can build up over your career. It is a very stressful career in general. But then when you throw in public perception of policing and, and public attitude and things like that, what we are trying to do is help officers, help our coworkers kind of overcome the stigma of asking for help and asking for I guess being being willing to talk about how they're feeling and, and acknowledging that it is stressful because for so long, like, let's face it, law enforcement is pretty macho, at least in the U.S., and we don't want to acknowledge that, like, this is stressful, this is upsetting, this is hard, this brings up a lot of negative feelings, and especially over time, you can just build up a lot of this really bad, bad, you know, stress and trauma and all this stuff. So many officers, so many people in law enforcement commit suicide and peer support is we're trying to kind of bridge that gap. Like we're not counselors, we are not therapists, but if we can help somebody get to the point where they are willing to see a therapist or see a counselor or get some help. And this could be, you know, they're having trouble with their marriage, they're having trouble at work, or they have some kind of substance abuse problem or something. That's what peer support is kind of designed to do. Because the thought is, is that a cop would be more willing to talk to another cop or talk to another agency employee than they would be to talk to, you know, a total stranger. So that's kind of where, where peer support comes in. Now, have you found an increase in the number of people seeking help this year? I personally haven't, but we, you know, confidentiality is, is really, really important. And so there's five or six of us on the, on the team here. I am the only civilian right now on the team. So that, I think that does play a little bit of an impact on, you know, officers or, or any employee actually is able, they're told, you know, they can ask for help. They can talk to any peer support person and they have a list of who we are and our phone numbers and everything. And they don't have to have permission. They can, they don't have to go through any kind of process or whatever to ask for help. They literally just reach out to a peer support member and just start, just start talking, just ask. And we do not discuss that 
with anybody else, including the other peer support members. So it could be that some of the other members are seeing kind of an increase and I just don't know it. I have been working from home for the majority of kind of the year. I've only been back in the office for like a week and a half now. So it could just be that since I was, I physically was not here, that could be why I'm not seeing as much contact as maybe some of the others. I don't know. Do you feel that most officers go to other officers on the team? Yeah, I I think so. We are kind of spread out in different units and on different shifts. And so I think they have a tendency to go to people. And it makes sense that they go to people that they are closer to. It's maybe somebody that was on their shift or is on their shift or maybe that they're closer in age to or something like that. So it's kind of the nice thing about having a variety of, we've got some detectives, we've got some patrol officers, we've got a couple of supervisors. So it's kind of nice to have a variety so people can go to whoever they feel comfortable with. And you also have a role with crisis and negotiation, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I'm the Intel officer for our crisis negotiation team. So I am not trained as a, as a negotiator. I don't want to be trained as a negotiator. I can't get on the phone. I don't want to do any of that stuff. I don't have the patience for that. And I would not want that pressure. So I'm stuck in the, you know, front of a Ford Taurus with my laptop on my lap in the front seat of the car, trying, you know, trying to find anything I can on the, on the person that we're talking to. So a lot of open source searching, social media, everything I can find them. Are they going through divorce? Are they, did they just lose their job? Have they been dealing with sickness or something? Whatever I can find so then I can pass it on to the negotiator because those may be topics that you really want to avoid. They may be topics, you know, if I find out that they have kids, maybe we want to focus on the kids. Like, hey, man, don't do anything stupid. You have to be your own for your kids, things like that. So that's what, kind of what I'm trying to do. And in addition to that, I'm also monitoring the police department's like social mon- social media pages. The benefit of working for a place like Raytown is that there is no other town named Raytown. Oh. So I can search Twitter. <laughs> yeah, it's really easy. I can search Twitter for Raytown and be confident that I'm not finding, you know, it's like there's, I think there's a city in every single state named Springfield, right? Mm-hmm. But there's only one Raytown. So I can search for everything named Raytown and be confident confident that it's specific to us. And so I have found pictures before where, you know, maybe our SWAT guys are hiding behind a bush and a neighbor's like, oh, hey, there's a SWAT guy over here. Well, then we need to tell them like, you probably need to move because they're posting pictures of the bush that you're hiding in, things like that. Oh, okay. So officer safety issue Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Our most recent, we don't have a whole lot of call outs because we are a pretty small town, but our most recent one was a guy who had some mental health issues. He had just actually killed a family member, and then had barricaded himself in the house. So the house was completely surrounded by by SWAT, which is, I'm not even sure, like 10 or 15 people. Not sure how big it is now. And then there were, see, part of our problem being such a small agency is that everybody wears multiple hats. So a lot of the people on our crisis negotiation team are also detectives. So I think there were three of us, or maybe just two of us in a crisis negotiation capacity because the other ones were working the crime scene. So it's not a huge group of people. So sometimes I end up within crisis negotiation, there's other roles that need to be played. Like you need somebody who is documenting, they call it the scribe, but you're documenting like what is being said when you're making calls, when they're answering the phone, things like that. So you also need a coach who's coaching the negotiator and and reminding them of different, like, hey, he seems to be responding to this particular topic or he's reacting badly to this topic. So I sometimes end up playing multiple roles in addition to, you know, the intel part of it example that you just said, were you doing the same thing? Were you yeah, um, that one, searching? Yeah, that one was a little bit different because this was somebody that we had dealt with quite a bit. Mm-hmm. So we were pretty familiar with him and knew knew about his mental health issues and his officer safety issues and things like that. And we knew where he was. He had so many kind of mental health issues surrounding like the validity of the police and were we real? Were we really the police? Could he trust us if he came out and things like that? So in that regard, there wasn't a whole lot for me to do. So on that particular call, I primarily was monitoring social media to make sure that like the neighbors weren't compromising officer safety with, you know, photos and comments and things like that. So eventually in your 10 year career at Raytown, you run into a scenario that's very uncomfortable. You get into budget issues and layoffs. And yeah, that was awful. I I think your story is interesting. So would you? Yeah. So so In 2017, this was actually right after the IACA conference this year, and I 
I would have to go back and tell you, I don't remember where we were in 2017, but right after that conference, like literally like the week or two weeks after, we found out that the city was forecasting essentially a $3 million budget shortfall for the upcoming fiscal year. Our fiscal year runs from November on, November 1st to October 31st. So they were proposing that the police department specifically cut, I think it was $2.7 million from our budget. Well, we're not a very big agency to begin with, so this was a, a really, really, really significant cut. And it ended up being just between that point that we found out that this was possibly going to happen. And then when it actually did was a really, really stressful time for everybody because we knew this was coming. It turned into this really ugly political fight. It got really pretty nasty. We were desperately trying to come up with like anything that we could cut. And we did cut uh, really everything we possibly could. But in the end, the cut was approved by the city council and the police department was forced So we had to lay off quite a few people and we had to cut 17 officer positions. So we went from 59 to 36 or whatever it was, which is really pretty significant. But unfortunately, so many officers were upset and distraught about kind of the instability and what was going on that more officers voluntarily left than actually needed to. So we never, we technically did not lay off any officers. We did lay off our entire detention staff. We had previously had 24 seven detention. we laid off all the detention officers. We laid off the office manager, the community services coordinator, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some people. There were some part-time, there was like a part-time property clerk and a part-time records clerk and and some of those kind of folks. And this whole time, uh, I didn't know if my job was safe. I mean, we didn't know. They talked about like outsourcing dispatch or were they going to cut records? Like pretty much everybody was up in the air. So that was super stressful just not even knowing if, you know, I was going to have a job to come back to at all. But then once, once they finally did determine, all right, these are the positions that we are cutting, they did decide to save me. I think part of that was the fact that I was funded by that public safety sales tax that I talked about at the very beginning. Some of that money was was able to be used for officers. So they could have turned that into an officer position, but they decided not to. I think they recognized that analysis can, you know, we can direct patrols and we can make some decisions on the effectiveness of, of our officers and where we need to be deploying resources and things like that. And, and we can basically help them work smarter, not harder, right? So they decided to keep me, which was a relief, but we cut so much and so many many officers left. Like we ended up having, I think it was 25 officers left. And not only were they some of the most, you know, some of those junior guys, because they were the ones that were part of that 17 that would have gotten cut if they didn't voluntarily leave. But we lost detectives with 10 years, 12 years of experience, supervisors with 15 years of experience. I mean, we lost that really important core of patrol and investigations. That was a really significant blow. And it really changed how we did business and how we're still doing business, frankly. I mean, we got to the point, they literally cut everything they possibly could have. And we were prepared to go back to paper reports. Like we cut all of our IT support. So if our RMS had broken and we couldn't fix it ourselves, meaning that I couldn't fix it, <laughs> then we were going to go to paper reports. So that tells you like how dire it was that we joked that we had like one pencil we would pass around the office because we couldn't afford to buy any more, right? And fortunately, our RMS didn't break. And the financial outcome of that fiscal year, it ended up being better than kind of what the projection was. And so we, we were able to bring some some of the detention folks back and the office manager and some of the other things. But we still don't have community services. Our investigations unit is half of what it was before. So there's a lot of cases that we have to. It's an unfortunate decision, but we frankly just do not have the resources to investigate some things that ideally we would. It's a tough decision, but what do you do when you've got violent crime? that has to be addressed. So it was a really it was a really tough situation. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. It was super stressful. It is still super stressful at times because we just don't have money for any kind of we've been able to add a few things in over time. We've been able to add a couple of positions back over time and we've rebuilt so to speak, but we're not nearly where we were, you know, say like early 2017 we're not back to that point yet. And I don't know if we're ever going to get back to that point because we just, we lost so much. The officers that we were able to recruit and hire since then to fill those open positions, they're they're great people, they're great officers, and they will eventually get to the point where they have experience, but they don't have it now. And so when you lose somebody that has 15 years of experience and you replace them with somebody who maybe has a year or no experience at all, like that's a big difference. That really changes things. So it's really kind of changed how we do business around here. Was there any talk about Kansas City absorbing Raytown? 
I think there was. I heard there was. I don't know. I don't know how factual that was or how far that actually got. But you know, there were definitely rumors that that Kansas City was going to annex us or that the county was going to take over or you know all kinds of different things. There was all kind of rumors flying around. So now, how realistic was, they were, I don't know. Was Raytown unique, or were there other places that were in a budget problem? No. So Raytown was pretty unique in the fact that we, without getting too much into the details, just because frankly, it's boring. (laughs) We were, at least in the Kansas City area at that time, we were pretty much the only agency that was having to deal with that. But I think it's, unfortunately, I think it's a city, a, a situation that other cities may or have found themselves in in other places too. Well, let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about IACA and Morcon. So All right. this is Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. We'll be right back. Hey everyone, it's Mindy from Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. Jason and I are happy to announce a new limited podcast series called Sean Bear's Guide to Hiring a Law Enforcement Analyst. In this series, Jason and Sean talk about different steps of the hiring process from both the standpoint of the hiring manager and the job seeker. As someone who recently got a new job during the production of the series, this really resonated with me. I learned a lot from this guide and it validated a lot of little practices I normally do like bringing a portfolio or sending a thank you letter after the interview. Little things I thought didn't make that much of a difference but could really give you an advantage over the competition. I think this guide provides great insights into the hiring world and Sean is so passionate about making sure that both parties are happy and benefit from the results. Obviously, this series was designed with hiring a quality analyst in mind, but I think the lessons can be utilized for other professions as well. Don't forget to check out our other projects on our website at www.leapodcast.com. Thanks! Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking with Kyle Stoker, who was showing his perseverance all through his career, surviving uh, being laid off and surviving not being laid off, I guess. You've been on both sides of the fence, (laughs) I guess. Now I want to get into your work with the associations. And I think I want to start with Markin, uh, which is Mid-America Regional Crime Analysis Network. For those that aren't familiar with local IACA associations, just kind of give an overview of what local associations do and what your group in particular does. Sure. So we're all just a little bit different, but essentially it's like the IACA in miniature and on a much smaller scale. So Markin is Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, and Arkansas, I think. That is just based on our current membership, like technically our bylaws don't specifically say what states we cover. So theoretically, you know, if somebody wanted to join from Oklahoma, we would be glad to have them, for example. But we are basically just an association of mostly crime analysts, but we also have some detectives. We have some students. We have a couple of professors. So you don't have to be a law enforcement employee to join. But same same lines as the ISA. We're trying to promote the, the field, trying to provide training and networking and things like that. So Throughout the years, Markin has had conferences. We haven't done a conference in a couple of years, but we try to do, during COVID, it's a little bit different, but we try to do training, regular training. We have a monthly meeting. We don't maintain a list like the, like a listserv like the IACA does or forums. We just haven't really seen a need to replicate what the IACA is already providing. But, you know, there is that networking opportunity and and we're trying to kind of grow some of the different resources and services and things that we can provide to to our members. So I think in that respect, we're pretty similar to like VCAN and NORCAN and some of the different MACA, some of the different regional associations. I guess if an analyst in your area needs help and you guys are local, so you have a more better understanding of what's going on regionally. Right, right. So, you know, again, we're kind of like I mentioned earlier, the analysts in the Kansas City Metro are, I'm really proud of us because we are really good about helping each other and sharing resources and sharing services and because not everybody can afford all the different subscriptions and things like that. And so Markan tries to foster that and tries to promote just that sharing and bouncing ideas off of each other and sharing products or templates and different things like that. 
And you've been president and vice president and hold a mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've been different... I've been kind of a couple of different things. I was I was president for a while. Uh, first, I started as vice president of membership. I took over for a gal that she left her position and left the organization, so I finished her term. Then I was president for a while. I'm still kind of serving as the webmaster, but <laughs> right now I'm the vice president of membership. So it's like any organization; you need to have volunteers to to make it run, and and so mm -hmm. I'm happy to step in and help kind of keep the organization going. And how many members do you have? Do you know? Uh, we have, a, yeah, we have 130 members right now. Okay. So yeah. pretty decent size. We're not the biggest. I know we can't compete with, you know, like California, but sure. you know, pretty, still a pretty decent group of people. You also volunteer for the IACA. Yes. And so I, I've even said on this podcast, I can't remember who the previous training director was. You've been doing it for so long. <laughs> I just can't. There's just a couple of staples there in the, with yeah. the association that as long as I've been active yeah. in the association, you've, I think, been the training director. Yes. Yeah, well, since 2012. Just take me through what you've been able to accomplish with training in the last yeah. eight years. Well, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize how big training actually is. Most people probably don't realize that we actually have several subcommittees. So one of the things that I was asked to do when I was brought on as training director was kind of formalize some of the processes for how, how we develop training, how we develop instructors. I have a subcommittee that their only job is to review applications for instructors and to make sure those people meet the criteria that when we send them out to represent the IACA, we are confident that they have the skills and the experience and the education to talk about what we're asking them to talk. You know, they actually know crime analysis and they're, mm. they're going to represent the association well. So I have a committee for instructors. And by the way, I'll put in a plug that if you are interested in being an IACA instructor, I would love to chat with you about that. We have an application on the website that you can check out. Then we have a committee that their only job is to review curriculum and to make sure that our curriculum is up to date and it's accurate in its best practices. And again, that when we're representing the association, that we are providing good information and good training. Most people are probably interacting with training in terms of emailing us or, or signing up for a class or taking a webinar. So they probably know. So there's me, Sabrina Potts handles all of the webinars and Angela Backer Hines handles all of the online and in-person classes. So they probably know those three names the best, but there's actually this whole group of people kind of behind the scenes that are helping us to maintain professionalism of IACA training to make sure that it's not just, I don't know, I guess my friend that I've decided like, hey, let me give you this opportunity. It actually is really good quality people. Yeah. And I had Angela on last week. So yeah. I did, I'm doubling up on the training aspect Absolutely. for IACA. Yeah. But I do think it's important. I think that one of the reasons analysts join the IACA is to learn more. What are some things that you've had to overcome in your eight years? Well, one is just kind of keeping up with the times. You know, things, technology changes so fast. Our profession has changed so much. And making sure that we're staying current with those trends, staying current with the topics that people want and need. So that's been kind of a challenge. And I won't pretend that we've been perfect. Um, we're trying to, you know, we're constantly trying to add new classes. One of the kind of the biggest lapses that I think we've had is that I feel like we have a really good foundation for brand new analysts or people that have very little experience, but not so much. Once you've been an analyst for five or six years or eight or nine years, what are you supposed to, what classes are you supposed to take now? Like you can't take fundamentals. That's obviously not going to be a good fit. So what we're trying to do for 2021 is add a lot more to our online training because let's face it, COVID's not going away anytime soon, mm -hmm. but also to fill in some of those gaps on some more advanced topics. So we are working on an advanced tactical analysis class and an advanced crime mapping class. So if you already have the basics, you can take some of these more advanced intermediate level classes and hopefully kind of refine your skills a little bit more. Yeah, I totally agree with the concept of value to an older analyst. It does seem like there's just gets to the point where you're, you're almost giving back. You're either becoming a volunteer, becoming a trainer, right. becoming a mentor that there isn't a lot out there. Because I found the difficulty with creating advanced classes or advanced topics for presentations is where to start. Oh, yeah. I, I think that's the reason why there's so many 
I agree. Uh, beginning classes is, is okay. I'll yeah. start from the ground and yes. work my way up. And when you get into an intermediate class, well, where am I supposed to assume people right. end it or what yeah. knowledge they're coming into the class with? So have you figured that out? Well, sort of, kind of. So that's been part of our discussion. And I think one of the things that makes the most sense to me, but it may still kind of work out because I'm, I'm the training director, but I'm not like the dictator, right? I take advice from other people and I take other people's inputs and, and our instructors and the curriculum developers, and we kind of all work together to come to a consensus. And one of the things that makes sense to me is to come up with kind of a list of things that we could put in the class description that says, okay, if you're going to take this class, you need to know how to do, you know, these five bullet points or these 10 bullet points or whatever they are. If you know how to do these things, then yes, you are kind of a good fit for this. But I, I don't want to set a specific prerequisite of you have to have taken our tactical analysis class, our basic tactical analysis class before you can take this one. Because I don't want to be a gatekeeper like that. You could have somebody who has never taken the tactical class, but they already have all that skill and knowledge that they need to take the advanced class. And I don't want to be the one that tells them that they can't. So we won't have any kind of like hard and fast prerequisites or anything like that. But I do think we'll probably come up with some kind of, like I said, a, a bullet points or, or something that says like, okay, you need to know how to make a pivot table or, or whatever it may be that kind of give people some idea. Is this a good fit or not? And I'm always happy to talk to people about our training and the content of a class, people will, on occasion, they will email and say like, hey, kind of here's a little bit of background about me. Here's my here's my experience or I have no experience. Where should I start or what would be the good best fit for me? And usually what I'll try to do is just have a little bit of a conversation with them. For people that literally have no experience at all, I may point them in one direction. If they have, you know, maybe they started as like a records clerk or they have some kind of experience in law enforcement, but maybe not in crime analysis, I may point them in, you know, somewhere else. It just kind of depends on person to person. Person. So if somebody has questions on that, they're not sure where to start or they're not sure if a class is a good fit and they don't want to spend the money without finding out first, which I understand, you are more than welcome to just send us an email. It's training at IACA.net and I will be very happy to, to have a phone call with you or have an email conversation and kind of talk about what would be the best fit for you. How do you decide on which classes to develop? Do you get a lot of requests from members? Yeah. So if you remember earlier in the year, we did kind of a survey on training needs and how do you feel about the existing classes? What classes do you feel we should offer? Things like that. And then we also, after every single class we give, whether that's in person or a webinar or one of the 12 week online classes, we always send out a link to our evaluation system. And in that evaluation for, again, every single class, it asks like, what topics do you want the IACA to teach? So we'll take that as suggestions. We use a lot of that to try to develop new things. And then sometimes it's just, it kind of gets born out of just conversations with different people or conversations with instructors. And sometimes instructors will come to us and say like, hey, I have an idea for a class. I have a couple of them that are in, in development for 2021. The instructor came to us and said, hey, are you interested in this? And so again, kind of like my plug for instructors a few minutes ago, I'll make a plug for curriculum as well. If you have an idea for a class, either one that you think would be you know, a great topic or one that you have developed or would be willing to develop, again, shoot me an email. I'd love to talk with you about it. It may be something that we're kind of already working on or it may, may not be you know, the best fit for a 12-week class, but it would be great as a webinar or vice versa. I'd love to talk with you about that. I, I like ideas. I want to hear from the membership. I want to hear from people. I want to know what you want to know so that we can meet those needs. It's not all about me. I don't, I don't pretend that I have, you know, kind of the end all be all of analytical training or anything like that. So <laughs> that I want comes, to hear from other That people. comes at year 10. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so one idea that I I'll steal from Christopher Bruce because he was on the show a couple of weeks ago is a stats class. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think and that's I a great idea. And yeah. I can't teach it. <laughs> so I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going to offer it and, uh, right, and yeah. just kind of do the Homer Simpson back in the bush thing. Cause I obviously can't teach stats, but yeah. that, no, I, I couldn't think... either. That's, that is a great idea though, because it is important to our job as boring as I will be the first to say, like, I hate stats. They're boring. I don't find it interesting at all, but it is really important. And, and it's important to have a basic understanding of what to use when and, and how to interpret results and things like that. I, I think that's a great idea. I've got it jotted down on my, uh, my notepad here. We'll take a look at that. And yeah. at the very least we could, you know, maybe do some webinars. We might be able to develop into, into a longer class too, but it is yeah. a very good idea. 
Yeah, there's almost two classes in there. It's mm -hmm. first how to do the stats, mm -hmm. and then second how to explain stats. Yes, to oh, yes. the audience. Right. right, that's a whole that's class huge. in its in itself. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I, I know this happened to me, especially early in my career, doing some mapping, especially is, you know, doing that hotspot stuff. People would start right. to say, well, what's, what makes that red? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and then you're trying to explain red kernel, is bad. kernel yeah. density to them. <laughs> and, you know, it didn't always go so well. Yeah, I, I agree. You know what, even if you've been an analyst for 20 years, that's one of the topics that like, it never hurts to have a refresher on that kind of stuff. So yeah, we'll definitely take a look at that. I guess, is there anything else that you're really wanting to see from the training section? You know, I'm, I'm really proud of what we have built over the last eight years. And I have a really, really fantastic group of people. I'm so proud of everybody on my committee. And I could not do any of the things that we're doing. I could not do them by myself. So I want to be very clear that like it is an entire group of people and it's not just me back here, you know, typing furiously away. So I'm really proud of that. I don't know that there's anything that like I think we're really missing out on. Obviously, there's always like new topics to add. And one thing that I want to do a better job of, and this is kind of, this will be the first foray of, is advertising that we have a library of previous webinars. I think a lot of people mm. forget that that exists, but there's 75 plus webinars in that library that you can watch anytime you want to watch them as many times as you want to. And I will even give you a certificate. Hmm. Um, it's uh, under the training menu on the website. And there's a link on there that explains how you can get a certificate for those classes. But there's so many different topics. And that's one of the things when we talked earlier about those suggestions that come in through the evaluations, people ask for access and Excel. And it, I don't think they have any idea that there's 14 or 15 webinars, hour long webinars on access. There's 14 or 15 on Excel. There's how to get hired. There's social media. There's using different software applications in different roles. There's all kinds of things on there. So if you're interested in learning more about a topic or you have questions about things, go look there first. We need to do some work on maybe redesigning that page and making it a little bit, because there's a lot of metadata that I have that I think would be useful to people, such as when a, we a webinar was recorded, because things do get out of date, you know, technology changes and things and things change over time. So we're going to hopefully be able to do some changes to the actual layout of that page so that it's a little bit more user friendly, but it's all that information is still there. It's a great resource, and I just don't think that a lot of people are aware of it. So we're going to try to do a better job of advertising that to the membership, um, yeah. but as long as you're a member, like I said, you can and watch those videos anytime you want to as many times as you want new sessions are added we don't record every single webinar so I'll, I'll kind of throw that out there that some webinars the instructor will not give us permission to record it it's up to each instructor and they just don't feel comfortable which is fine some webinars like the recording the, the technology just doesn't work and the recording comes out bad so if we have a webinar and you are interested in the topic, I strongly suggest that you sign up for it live because I can't guarantee that we will record it and make it available. But if it is recorded, there's a 45 day waiting period before we put it on the library. And that's just to encourage people to actually participate live instead of waiting for the, for the recording. Cause you know, they're only 10 bucks and we do that because it furthers the association, that money goes right back into the association to pay for conferences and scholarships and all kinds of different things. And 10 bucks is not very much for an hour long webinar. So, but yeah, yeah take advantage the, of those videos because those are really cool. Yeah. And uh, what do you use? Go to meeting or uh, go to we, webinar? Yeah, yeah, we use GoToWebinar for the, so we can have up to 500 people in every single webinar. So there's the, the virtual conference sessions. There are a couple of those that have filled up completely, but for kind of our regular uh, sessions that are, are not free, we have plenty of seats available for anybody that wants to participate. So for those looking for that webinar library, go to IACA.net. Uh -huh. Click on the training menu at the top and you'll find IACA webinar library. Yep. They're listed. You'll have to log in. So. Yes, it is. It is members only. And so right now there's free webinars going on, right? Uh -huh. Do you have a full schedule for this? Uh, yeah. So if you go to the conference page, like the conference menu, if you hover over that, there's a 2020 virtual conference page and there are five member led sessions right now, but we could be adding more. And then uh, I'm not sure on the exact number, eight or nine, I think, exhibitor-led sessions. Those are all completely free. We've had two of the member-led ones already, and I think maybe they've had one of the exhibitor-led ones as well. But the videos are on there, so you can go back and watch them. Everything's all on one page. Like I said, some of them have filled up already. 
but we will be putting the videos up. All of them, all the member led ones will be recorded. So if you've, you know, didn't get a chance to sign up, you'll be able to go back and it'll be on that same page. So you can bookmark that one page and get, get there. But the response has been fantastic. The very first class we had, we had people from 36 different countries participate. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was really, really excited about that. I guess that's not yeah. normal, right? No, uh uh-uh. uh. No. Normally we have, I don't know, five to 10 different countries. To have 36 is pretty incredible. For the virtual conference specifically, we are trying to add some Spanish language webinars. I don't know when those will be exactly because that's still kind of in the planning stages, but we're hopeful that we'll add those so that we can absolutely be international. So as a regular attendee of the conference, what does it mean to you that the conference was canceled this year? Oh man, I was so bummed. You know, I think I think it's the right decision. Absolutely, I supported it 100%. And it, honestly, if we had held it, I probably would not have traveled because I take this seriously. But I am really bummed. I really miss seeing everybody. As much of, as an introvert that I am, <laughs> I still miss seeing everybody. For me, the conference is, it's just... The one time of the year that I really get to be surrounded by my fellow nerds, just, you know, you just get to recharge. And I think one of the coolest things about it is, and this is what I've told people multiple times, is I don't go to the conference to learn specifically how to do a particular task. Like, I don't expect them to teach me if I click in these four, you know, in this sequence, I will know how to make a map and do this particular thing. But it teaches me that this particular thing is possible. And then I can figure it out on my own or I can get follow-up training or whatever, but I didn't know that it was possible before. And that's the cool thing about the conference is you get all these ideas of, oh, wow, I didn't, you know, I didn't even think about using mapping to do this or creating a prolific offender database to do this or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. That's to me, the really cool thing about the conference is just learning like all these other people who are way smarter than I am. Like, what are the Mm -hmm. things that they are coming up with? And like I said, just kind of recharting and getting excited again about the field. Not that I'm not excited during the rest of the year, but it just, it really gets me fired up. I'm like, yes, this is so cool. I really love this. And I miss seeing everybody and, and kind of getting that energy and everything. Yeah, totally agree. I was looking forward to Chicago. I've only yeah, been to too. Chicago. I really was. I've only been to Chicago Airport, so I've oh, never yeah. had anything. So that Chicago has been on my bucket list for a while. So yeah. I was totally bummed by that. But hopefully, we get back there uh, yeah. someday. Okay, let's take another break, and when we come back, we'll finish up with some questions, and then we'll get into some personal interest. You're listening to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. We'll be right back. Hey there, everybody. This is Albert Mesa, and I'm here to ask you a very important question. Have you ever done a sit-along with the dispatcher? If the answer is no, and you're currently an analyst, you're missing out on a huge piece of the data puzzle. Not only will you open your eyes to how data is captured, entered, and coded, you'll see how calls are prioritized and dispatched and get a true feel for CAD data. You'll get to see it in a whole new light and use it as a tool in your analysis. And who doesn't want to sit with the true first responder who probably saved a life right before they sat with you? Hi, this is Sean Fisher. And at my work, we're known as the Nerdery. And we're proud of it. Embrace who you are. Hi, this is Steve French. And I have a message to you about language. Language is really important when you're doing your job. For instance, it isn't a zucchini, it's a courgette. It isn't a lobby, it's a foyer. It isn't Z, it's Z. Buses go on routes, not routes. And it is never, ever, made out of aluminum. Welcome back. Before the break, we're talking to Kyle Stoker about his volunteer work with both Morgan and IACA. I just follow up question on our segment on IACA. Yeah. You received the ambassador award from mm. IACA in 2016. Yeah. Uh, I guess the, for those that aren't familiar with that. What is the ambassador award and how does one obtain it? Um, (laughs) Well, it's to honor people who are, you know, we are an international organization. There's always room for improvement in that regard, but it was honoring the fact that, you know, we were holding training in different countries and, and trying to reach new audiences. And so I believe that the entire board decides, it's not just the president that decides who receives that. So I was incredibly honored. But again, it's not just me that is the training committee. Like I'm not just a one person committee. It is the entire group of people. So I really can't take credit for all of that. It's this whole group of really wonderful people that I'm lucky to work with that made that possible. And you've won the board award as well. 
Mm-hmm. And you probably could win that every year. <laughs> I don't. I don't know about that, but <laughs> I you know, appreciate that. But the it's a, but it's like in sports; they don't want to see the same person <laughs> win MVP every year, right? Yeah, that'd be boring. Yeah. I, I think. Uh, I think so. They're they're just uh, not going to give it to you every yeah. every year. Well, but I really think someone could make an argument every year. Well, I am. That, I am very. I'm very flattered. I try. You know, I feel like I'm pretty easy to work with and. You know, I try to be diligent in responding to people and doing the things that I say I'm going to do and following up and, and things like that. And I think that goes a long way. This is going to seem random to ask this now, <laughs> but I'm, it was on my list, so I'm going to ask yeah. it. So you assisted with the hiring process in Miriam Police mm-hmm. Department. In terms of the hiring guide, Sean suggested this is mm-hmm. using a neighboring analyst to help yeah. hire an analyst. Could you talk through that from a personal experience, how it was coming into a different police department and helping them? Yeah, hire you know, their that, analyst? that was really, really interesting. And I'm really glad that they asked me to do that. So they actually, I sat on the oral board process and I think we interviewed, it was one day, but I think we interviewed five or six people. And so it was me and uh, Jamie Nelson from Overland Park. And then they had some internal people who also sat on that oral board. And they had never had an analyst before. And their mix of candidates, they did not have anybody who really had previous experience. It was interesting because um, I specifically remember one, and I don't remember which candidate it was, but one of the guys who was on the oral board from Miriam was a, like a senior patrol officer or something. After the candidate had left and we were discussing the scoring and everything, he was kind of down on the guy because this person had, and I don't remember exactly what brought it up, but basically his attitude was like, well, man, I knew from a, like, I always wanted to be a cop. Like this guy kind of bounced around and did a bunch of different stuff. And like, that seems to be kind of a negative. And I I had to explain to him like, yes, crime analysis has been around for a while. Like it's not new, but it's also not been a really prolific thing. And I personally, I graduated with a criminal justice degree and had never heard of crime analysis until they hired an analyst at Olathe. And I think that's true for a lot of people, but you can't try to be something that you don't know exists. Mm -hmm. And so it was just kind of interesting that Jamie and I were able to give them some, some feedback on some of the candidates on, you know, some people looked really good on paper, but then it was very, very clear to her and I during the interview that they really had no idea what they were talking about. I mean, there was one guy that he was asked to define problem oriented policing and he literally could not answer that. He, he just sat there and said, uh, like, okay, at least say that it's policing (laughs) oriented around the problem. Right. Like he couldn't even do that, but on paper, they thought he looked really good and they were excited to interview him. So I think having that opportunity, like I said, it was really interesting. I'm really glad that they asked me to do it. I was honored that they asked me to do it, but I think it was really beneficial as well because they really didn't know. Then they used interview questions from the IACA and they had, you know, prepared as well as they could, but they really didn't know what they were asking for. So I think having those, having us, the local analysts on there, the working analysts really helped them find Find somebody who was a good fit and didn't just look good on paper because that would have really like, can you imagine hiring an analyst who who cannot define problem oriented policing, like not even in the slightest? Yeah. So it was a cool experience, though. I'm glad we got to do it. I think that's especially important if you don't have an analyst already. Mm -hmm. I I, I think it's a good idea regardless. But if you don't have an analyst established already, getting help from a neighboring jurisdiction because you're all working together. Oh yeah. Anyway, early should, right. You talked about being, right. this being a team sport. So it's a great opportunity to start networking with surrounding departments mm-hmm. with the hiring process. Let's switch into personal interests. Oh um, man. So let's, uh, I guess my first question is what's your COVID video game? Uh, so I've kind of bounced around just a little bit. I've been playing No Man's Sky a lot, which mm-hmm. I don't know if you've heard of before, but it's basically like space exploration and there's like thousands of different planets and you just kind of like roam around in your spaceship and build different bases and you find alien life forms. It's pretty dorky. I'm totally exposing to the world how much of a dork I am right now, but that's okay. <laughs> just own it. I w- yeah, exactly. Right. So I've been playing that. I finally got around to playing the new God of War. I was late to the game on that, but I, I finished that up a few weeks ago. I just started playing Ghost of Tsushima. Pretty cool so far. So I kind of bounce around a bunch of different things. 
And then you're into building model cars. Uh, yeah, so I do cars and there's scale models of pretty much anything you could think of. Uh, ships, planes, cars, tanks, motorcycles, buildings, construction equipment, all kinds of different things. But yeah, that's kind of my other big main hobby. It's really, uh, to me, I really enjoy doing stuff with my hands, something that's not at a computer, that's not staring at a TV screen. So it gets me away from the electronics. It's a perfect quarantine hobby because, <laughs> you know, you don't need to be around other people. And it's, it, it takes, it does take a lot of time. So it kind of keeps you occupied for a while, but it's kind of like Legos, but on a more detailed uh, scale and, and more realistic looking. But, you know, I like I really like history and, and learning about different historical aspects and things. And so it kind of ties into that. And uh, it's just something I really enjoy. Yeah. So how many have you completed? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I, like a lot of people, I, I built model kids as a kid and then kind of got out for, of it for a while. And so since I've kind of been back in the hobby, 10 to 12, probably, I mostly yeah. do planes, but I've done a couple of things and stuff. So I've got some stuff here in my office that I kind of display. So everybody walking by can see what a nerd I am. So how long does it usually take you to oh, build it can, one? It can take like, depending on, so there's different scales. So different sizes of like one foot on the real thing is, you know, however many inches on the model. So the, depending on the scale of the model and the complexity of it, uh, is, they can take like 80 to oh, 200 or so hours on some of the more complex ones. It's, it's one of those hobbies that like what you put into it is what you get out of it. So if you're just looking for something to like kill some time and you don't really want to put a lot of detail into it, that's totally fine. And if you want to spend, there's some people that get like really serious about it and they're, they're pretty dedicated on like, well, no, this particular color wasn't used until June of 1943. <laughs> so your so your model is completely wrong because the you know that paint didn't exist then and I don't care that much I just want something that looks cool and is fun to build so oh yeah but yeah you can put as much time into it as you want so now is putting stickers on the cars <laughs> is that considered a no no <laughs> hey it's your mo I, in my opinion it's your model you build for yourself so if you want to put stickers all if you want it to be bright pink and have stickers all over it that's totally cool it's whatever you want Man, that drives me crazy when yeah. my kids have something that I have to put stickers on. Oh, yeah. I my cringe when I see a, a whole <laughs> sheet of stickers that it, have to go on it, something. It definitely takes a lot of patience. And, and I'll be honest, I'm not very good, so I mess up stuff. And so sometimes you have to, like, strip the paint off and start all over again or just throw the whole thing away and, you know, chalk it up to a learning experience. And I guess one last thing, your uh, football team won the Super Bowl. They did. It, right? it was like, it feels like 20 years ago, like it was <laughs> not in 2020, I guarantee you that, but they did win the Super Bowl, yes. All right. So how long have you been a Chiefs fan? Oh, well, pretty much my whole life. I, I, oh, great. I, I've always lived in Kansas City metro area, so we've pretty much always been fans. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to have a team that is competitive and that wins. It makes it a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, I, it is interesting, and I think the NFL is nice in this regard. You don't normally go decades oh, without yeah. your team mm -hmm. being in the playoffs and being significant, Agreed. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, but it was funny. It wasn't that long ago that I was like, man, I – I don't ever remember the Royals being in the playoffs. Oh, yeah. Like, they 30 went, years. like, 30 years, mm -hmm. and I was like, I don't remember them yep. being significant, right? Yep, 30 years is a long time, man. Yeah, yeah. So, hopefully, we won't have to go that long for the next. I mean, if the NFL season is able to happen, which I'm kind of holding my breath on, you know, I think I think we'll be competitive as long as everybody stays healthy, so... Yeah. I mean, when you have your childhood team mm -hmm. who hasn't, hadn't won it your whole life and then, mm -hmm. you know, they, they finally do, that is a great feeling. Oh, absolutely. It was awesome. Like I said, it just, it feels like so long ago now. <laughs> I'm being dorky about fantasy football because I'm like, uh, yeah. I don't want it to break my heart. I don't oh, want I know, to, right? I don't want to like, put all this work and studying mm -hmm. and drafting these players yeah. and then them not have a season. Oh, I know. I, I feel the same way. I'm, I'm really holding my breath. I, I just, I am not hopeful that it's going to happen. I mean, I want it to, but I want people to be safe. I'd hate for a player to have, have it, have such a serious case that they had like actual long-term health complications. That's not yeah. worth it. It's just a game. So yeah. I'm going to be, disappointed if it doesn't happen i hope it does but i'm not holding my breath okay so our last segment is words to the world this is where you get to promote any idea that you want to kyle yeah. so what are your words to the world 
So my world, words to the world is register to vote and then actually vote. And I mean this at every possible level. City council, as you listened to my story earlier, city council elections are really important. They set the budget. So if you are unhappy with the way that your city is acting, make sure that you vote in that election. Statewide, national, in whatever country you are, vote. And this also goes for the IACA. I think it's a shame that voting in the IACA is as low as it is in general. And I would really, really love to see a much bigger proportion of our membership participate in surveys that we send out, voting and and all those kind of things. Because this is an organization of members for members. And we can't do that if you don't tell us the things that you want and the things that you need and, and stuff like that. So my words are just vote and participate and be active. Well, I tell my guests, you've given me just enough to talk bad about you later. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Which I do appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, I, I'm glad. Thank you so much for having on me. This was a really cool experience. All right. You be safe. All right. You too. Thank you for joining us today on Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. We hope you not only enjoyed the show, but also learned something new. For more information on our guests and information relating to today's topic, please visit our website at leapodcast.com. Special thanks to the Rough and Tumble for our theme song. For more of their music, you can visit their website at theroughandtumble.com. Also thanks to Kyle McMullen for our show logo. For more of his design, please visit his website at moderntype.com. The show is hosted, recorded, and edited by Jason Elder and written by me, Mindy. You can contact us both via the LEA podcast website. Please join us again next time as we interview another expert in this great field.